Hi, everybody. So this is the ritualistic, why don't you come down front, those in the back, if you can. It just makes it more homey. And it's not an order, but it's an invitation. You Come on, come on, come on. Come on. So uh, very glad that uh, Chris Dixon can be with us today. You know, we, we were um, talking before this session, and I was explaining that art direction is not offered as part of the curriculum at this journalism school. And yet, uh, those of you who end up going to work in magazines, especially those of you who end up as editors, but also those of you who are writers, are going to uh, have to deal with, with the art director in one way or, or another. And, and Chris said to me, you mean the enemy, the enemy. And I never, you know, the, the people who are outside of the business would assume that uh, the art director and the um, writer and the editors are collaborators. And uh, people inside the business know they're collaborators, but also there's a culture class, which we'll get into in our conversation. So I, I discovered, I hadn't known this, that uh, Chris was the art director of the many award-winning Adbusters magazine, which is a Canadian magazine. How many of you have heard of that or know it? Hey, look at all these hands. This is, okay. So it's one of my favorite magazines. This is a great thing. So it's, we get a double here. We've got this bonus. We've got the art director of the award-winning um, Ad Busters, and uh, he also, and he redesigned and reconceptualized the magazine, and then uh, he worked at the New York Times Magazine, where I worked at long before he got there, and, uh, and now he is the art director of New York Magazine, and I never can keep uh, track of the titles, design, and everything to do with the look of the magazine, and, uh, and they win. Uh, countless awards for this art direction. So we're very pleased that you can be here with us. Why don't you come up and we'll have a conversation. And Chris Andrews, so let's. Chris Dixon. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll join you over here, Chris. And um. So. Uh, Chris, let's go back to what we were talking about before we came downstairs. <laughs> and you made the joke about the art people and the editorial people being the enemy. You want to elaborate on that and, and tell that story you started to tell me about what happens when a writer turns in his piece? And sure. Um, the, uh, we were talking upstairs, and it's, a it's amplified at a weekly magazine, but the nature of the, the fast turnover is that you, you know, the writers have to file their stories and there's, um, you know, the given estimated word count, it's either 3,000 words, 4,000 words, 5,000 words that the writer's working with or 8,000 words. Um, and that's the, what it's been planned to. So the writer writes that length and you know, the editor is working with them um, during this process. But because as a weekly, we have to produce, you know, put the ma magazine together as this is happening, as the writer is writing a lot of times. So we have to design with this estimated work count. So we'll be told 4,000 words, and we are going to work. And we have our photography, our illustration that we've commissioned. Um, and we do all our typography, and we put the story together. Um, then the, a lot of times the story comes in you know, Wednesday night, and we close the magazine Thursday nights. And the writer will, you know, he's had these breakthroughs, and it's, he's working at 4,500 words. Or it's got to, we got to fit 5,000 words. So that's where the enemy aspect comes in, because then the editor will come to us. It's you know, 10 o'clock at night, and they say, we've got to fit another 700 words, which thus the result of that is that the photographs have to get smaller, or things like white space, or the typography has to be changed. And so then we always have to just sort of go to the editor-in-chief, Adam Moss, and we all have to gather around and complain and make our cases. And he'll say, well, you can have 350 more words and make this photograph smaller. And then the photography director will scream because the, you know, they spent $10,000 on this photo shoot, and so you don't want to shrink the photographs any smaller than you have. So that's the battle that goes on the last two days of you know, finally closing a magazine. Of course, there's many positive things that happened before that. But, but. I've had writers who, who 
tell me that they, you know, these are writers who are old pros and who have the uh, allegiance and respect of their editors, but they tell me they are intentionally late turning in their copy so people can't monkey around with it and cut it. And right. This is, uh, this is what it's come to, anyway. Let me ask a question. Is Jose out there? Hey, Jose. I don't see any magazines here. Are they? Did we? Are we handing them out outside? Good. Great. Okay. So, Jose, courtesy of Jose, you all have these magazines. So, terrific. Um, I'm, what we're going to do, I'm going to, we're going to talk for about half an hour, and, and then you guys are going to have a half hour to join the discussion. But if anyone can't contain themselves in the middle of our conversation, feel free to, to get up and and leap in. Um, w some of the students out here are part of magazine workshops, and they put out their own magazines, one of them New York Review of Magazines and others. One of the questions that comes up when we're, we look at last year's magazine uh, is, has to do with space. And so the question is, why is white space important? since it takes away our ability to put words in, which is what most people here want to right. do. extra words. Yes. Um, I think if you've established, uh, I think overall it's, it's important for the pacing of the magazine. That's something we talk a lot about when we put together an issue. We build up a board of um, minis, we call them. It's sort of miniature versions of each layout. And they're all up on the wall. And you can see you know, how the issue is progressing you know, page to page, story to story. And I think we do things like we'll build in more white space into one part of the magazine, you know, in order to let it breathe is something that, you know, a term that they have to use, let's let this breathe, where you want to have the feeling, it's sort of a more luxurious sense uh, to read the story. If it's a longer essay, build in white space, make the photographs bigger, you know, don't have a cluttered layout. But then what we do usually, you'll see in the magazine, we'll go move straight into a very, very dense section, like our st the strategist section, which is the service part of the magazine. And we designed that section to be really, really dense, so we actually don't pursue as much white space in that section. That's sort of, we try to perfect the art of you know, maximum content in some way. So we have multiple type sizes that are, you know, they're part of the design format and they're consistent, so you know, all the way down to like a seven point type size, which is very small and nine point, which is the medium, and then 14 point, which is sort of the larger, you know, more quick read. So we build in all these different levels of type, and we make a really dense section, and then when we get back into the culture section at the end, we'll open it up again and have more white space in there. And so I think it, you know, gives, it works well with the pacing of the magazine, and it can give a certain story, a certain feeling of, um, you know, a certain luxurious or comfortable feeling while reading it that'll actually bring a certain tone to the story that you wouldn't have if it was a lot, you know, packed in a lot denser, so. Okay. Uh, how do you, or how does an art director make the basic decision about a piece? Um, whether it should have, for example, should it have a photograph or an illustration? Uh, how do you decide that? I can give you subjects of pieces, and then you tell me, should right. this have a photograph or an illustration? Yeah, that's kind of the essence of, um, I mean, there's multiple levels to the visual side of a magazine, and you have, you know, the design aspect is kind of what I mentioned. It's the actual um, presentation on the page. So the size and the scale and balance and composition of pages, so there's almost the visual element to it. But the, the whole thing starts with, and it's more the job that I have, is we, we meet, it's myself and the photography director, it's um, Jody Kwan, and then Adam Moss is the editor. And really the three of us have a weekly meeting where we go through upcoming stories and we have that exact conversation. What, is it, you know, what does it look like or what's the visual strategy or the visual tone? Because you can go a thousand ways you know, if it's a political story. Um, I think one that we just did you know, I, someone issue had is the John Edwards story. We did a, an excerpt from the book, the um, John Hallman book. And that, you know, that's an excerpt from a book about a, the affair that John Edwards had, you know, while he was running for president. So that's a conversation, how do we present this visually? It's all, you know, we can't obviously do photographs because it's things that we didn't, 
you haven't seen, um, or scenes that happened that were never, obviously, anyone was there for. So for that, we did something which is kind of called a graphic, no graphic novel, which you have a graphic novelist or il illustrator create a sequential narrative throughout the piece and illustrate scenes that happen. So <clears throat> the reader can still um, experience the, you know, the sort of play-by-play -play of what happened, but it's illustrated in this graphic novel style. But they're not static illustrations. They're sort of multi-paneled things. So that's one strategy to illustrate a story. Um, other things are more obvious. If you have a, you know, a famous person or a famous politician, the idea that you want to get access to photograph them, so that you have a, you know, exclusive photograph that we can, when we credit, you know, you can get photographs either by. It's called picking up, called pick up, which means it's already run somewhere else or photographed. It's pre-existing, and you just pay a fee and you run it. But it's not exclusive to your magazine. So if you're doing, you know, a story, I think we have a story coming up on Harold Ford Jr., um, the politician. And so we we call and get access in permission through through his people to photograph him. And then when we run a portrait of him, then it's our own portrait. It's done for New York Magazine. So. You pose him. Uh and ask them to do strange things. And well, it depends on lend themselves. That's to that sort of a whole other degrading world. ritual. Or, uh. If you're able to get, you know, the idea that some public figure will play along on a conceptual image, then you take advantage of that. A lot of times, they, the reality is, you know, you'll get five minutes or three minutes. The photographer will get with, you know, if you're doing someone like Al Sharpton or something, a photograph of them, they'll be in the middle of their busy day and they'll say, you know, at 12:30, you get five minutes with them. So the photographer will come early, set up the backdrop, set up his lighting, get everything ready, the p person will come in, sit down, and you shoot a bunch of shoot. Even you get the most interesting picture you can in that amount of time. But other ways, and actually for Harold Ford Jr., we did get you know, an hour with him, and he was willing to, I don't remember what he did. He had an apple, or he was doing things. You know, I think he's running for um, uh, Senate right now, and so. Maybe. He, maybe, uh, yeah. <laughs> So he, he was able to play along and you get a conceptual photograph. Or if someone really wants to do things like dress up or put in different outfits or put on makeup and you know, and sort of the bigger the magazine, Vanity Fair is sort of the master of, you know, people want to be in Vanity Fair and they will be working with, you know, Annie Leibovitz or a famous photographer, so they'll be happy to do things like get in a bathtub or, you know, right. dress up out in a field and those kind of things that they get. So it all depends on the relationship with. But anyway, back, yeah, so that's, if you photograph someone, you want to just see a portrait of them, you know, in real time. Otherwise, the more conceptual things, we find ways to illustrate. Or we just do straight illustration, like caricature or um, things like that. And should the, uh, should there be contact between an author and an illustrator in the ideal situation? And what is the norm? I know I've worked at magazines where they don't let the author near the illustrator. They don't let the author near the headline, even. It's just you turn in your piece, right. you work until it's in shape, and then you're out of the picture. But what, what do you do, and what is the ideal relationship there? I think that's about, we don't have much contact with the actual writer of the piece. We deal with the editor of that piece. And so the editors work on staff for our magazine, so we see them all through the day. And they're in contact with the writer, but they, you know, that their editor will write the headline and the deck and the subheadline and all those things. So they won't do that. Um, and unless it's a really basic information thing, we won't go to the author except to say, you know, we need a certain amount of information for it. But we'll go to the editor. We'll have a meeting and we'll say, what's the story about? And he'll sort of interpret what the writer's going to write because you know his job is to guide the the writer through the process as well. So we don't. We just deal straight with the editor. So. Um, in last week in our own uh, workshop on, on um, magazine productions, we had in uh, the art consultant, Nancy Butkus, and she came in with a PowerPoint presentation of different types of fonts, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, they sort of went by very quickly, and, uh, and this week she's going to ask, okay, pick one or pick right. two. What, what, I mean, what should writers and editors know about topography and fonts? Or would you rather they know nothing and leave you to do what you know and? Uh, well, I think, um, I mean, depending on the magazine, some magazines are more formatted in terms of how they present the, you know, especially for feature stories in the middle of the magazine, the big, the longer pieces, 
they'll be more formatted in the set size and you read the headline and the subheadline more in newspaper style. And so we're somewhere in between where we actually do, you know, a more expressive treatment of the headline um, inside. So it sort of relates to the story. And you can create some drama for the piece and have it work off the photograph. Um, so we pay a lot of attention to typography. And we, there, we have a set family of typefaces for the magazine when we redesigned it. And so we actually don't ever stray from that. We think that having, you know, we have a family of about five typefaces. And we rotate those for different things depending on the the use in the magazine, and I think that gives the magazine its you know part of its visual identity, and there's a consistency that the reader looks for with that. So we have five typefaces. We use them you know on the cover, and when we introduce a new one, it's kind of a big deal that we have to go through a series of you know experimentation, and um, and you know you want don't want to disrupt the the feeling of the magazine, and so I think just in the, about a year and a half ago we started using a a new typeface named Egyptian. Um, it's actually a a typeface that the New York Magazine used to use in the 60s and 70s. It was one of their original typefaces. So we sort of introduced that, and it, you know, it makes the um, the designers are happy because they have something new to work with. It's a different shape. It's got a different feeling that it brings to it. Um, it's a, it's a, called a slab serif. It's the thicker typeface. So, but. Um, but in terms of writers, I think we, I mean, the editors can appreciate because we'll have a conversation with them about how we want to present the story. And so they, they get to be part of that conversation. Uh, is it possible to articulate beyond, OK, it's new, so that gives you variety, uh, what the, that it's readable because it has certain characteristics. But beyond those obvious things, what are the principles on which one makes a type selection? It's hard to have this conversation without having the fonts up there, but. Right, yeah, uh, we could have. Um, well, I think, I mean, ours are all quite different. We have, the, I mean, the basics, I don't know how, how much everyone knows about typography, but there's a serif typeface, which is the thinner one with the serifs on the end. And those, um, those are used for the body text, and so that's the main stuff that you read is the smaller stuff, and that that's all set up just for pure readability and legibility. Um, but we also use that typeface in bigger, when it gets bigger and more expressive, it has a certain, I mean, the, how we talk about it is uh, the news stories, if there's a story about a scandal or some sort of tabloid kind of thing, we'll use one of the sans serif typefaces, which are the big, fat, thick, sort of black ones. And we'll get a lot of size on those, and they'll feel this sort of urgent feeling, or you'll kind of shout the headline. And then another story that's maybe a more of an essay will do sort of something small with the serif typeface, and it has that more of a bookish kind of um, essay feel to it that you see in old books, small and beautiful type, and mix into typefaces. So it really does change the, um, the experience of the story. And the, you know, it's good to have an editor. You know, Some editors that we work with just aren't as sensitive to it, not because of anything of fault of theirs, it's just in their, the way they, you know, they'll just work on their stories and their words and they'll just say that's great. But the editor of the magazine, Adam Moss, he's very, very savvy to design and visuals and so it's sort of an equal thing for him and so we'll present our designs to him and part of the design will be how we, you know, interpret the headline and the size of it and he'll see it and he'll say, no, no, this is all wrong, it's like it's shouting it and it's making it feel, you know, I want it to be really calm and feel like a beautiful reading experience. And so then we'll adjust the design through the typography to have a different feeling to the content. So he's, he comes and looks at it and sort of feels if we're interpreting the story properly. So Good. Um, I remember once at, at The Nation magazine, we were talking earlier about the great uh, artist and caricaturist David Levine. He once did a great uh, caricature, and what it was, it was for an article about the neo-Nazis in this country, and it showed Uncle Sam with the Fuhrer, with the Hitler mustache. It was a very striking image. The writer got very upset, and she said, this is the opposite of what I was saying. And uh, we ran it on the theory that it wasn't the opposite of what she was saying, that it was a way of drawing attention to what she was saying, and that it worked no matter right. what you thought she was saying. But my question is, do you have um, writer reactions that to sometimes to the art direction that cause you problems? Uh, you have an editor in Adam Morse who understands art direction in a way that many editors don't. Right. I wonder what you 
wish writers could understand about what your role is and editors could understand about what your role is? Yeah, I think we have, the, I mean, the one thing at New York Magazine is there's a, right, there, this, a lot of our writers are on staff, so they actually have a section of the office where they have, you know, a cubicle and they spend their days there, or part of their days there. So they're free to walk the halls and see what's going on. And so if they're working on a cover story that week, um, you know, writers like Jennifer Senior or um, Bob Kolker, they will wander down near my office, and I usually have the covers. We were working on various covers, and they'll be outside my office on this ledge that we'll be talking about. But they'll often stop, and, and um, they won't say it while we're there because we're in process. They might say they love it at that point and move on, but other times they'll go to their editor, you know, say John Holman's staff editor, and say something, and then they'll be told to come behind back. Behind your back. Yeah, they go behind our back. Yes. And they'll say, and then he'll come to us and he'll say, or to Adam, and just say, oh, you know, by the way, Jennifer thought that, you know, this piece was, you know, I mean, basically it's so, it's tough because it's so close to them and they're writing it and they have a certain perception of it. And they'll say, yeah, exactly that. It's somehow it's wrong or it's interpreting the piece wrong or it, it just shouldn't work for the cover that way. I know you don't make any mistakes, Chris, but what are the mistakes that art directors make? And what should a writer editor do to intervene? But maybe you've already told us that. Go behind your back and say, <laughs> unmake that mistake. But what are the things that, that, that you can think of that cause problems? I guess I think I, you know, it would be one, having a, a um, I think we're, we're part of the responsibility of the art department and the photography department to some degree is just to have a really solid understanding of the content that you're given, so whatever the writer's written. And you know, for our magazine, it's anything from long features to all the short pieces that are in the front section or the strategist, even things all down to you know, charts and things like that that we have to visualize. But if you have, the deeper your understanding, I think, of the content, then I think the writer will be happier with the outcome, and you know, you'll know you be able to have a conversation with the editor about it. I think there's a general feeling that we, or there's, an, there's a kind of um, generalization that we don't read the pieces that we're designing, that we will, we'll get a headline and we'll get a story and, and we'll just sort of go into it to create this whatever visual excitement that we are feeling that day it's for our own sort of satisfaction. And so a lot of times we'll have meetings about a story and we will put together a presentation of how we're going to visualize it and the editor will say, well, if you would have read it, you would have known that it does. So they're assuming that we haven't read the right. piece and we don't understand, you know. And so there's a sort of sense that on the we're not on the word side so we wouldn't have read it. So we try to, you know, approach it, you know, as journalists as well and, um, you know, read the stories and know the background and know exactly what, I mean, as much as we can on a weekly, but know the goals of the piece. And, you know, once you get a core understanding of that, then I think you can visualize it better. And I think that's where a lot of the clashes come in is because people just see this thing that has no relation to what they produced right. or is even factually wrong. So, okay. uh, You talked earlier about um, reviving a typeface that had been originally part of New York. How does a publication establish its visual identity, and why does it change, and how does it change? Uh, other th again than saying, "Well, we're tired of it; it's time for something right. new." I mean, well, I think it starts with we did a redesign of, of New York Magazine five years ago when the, sort of a whole new staff came over, and it was the editor was Adam Moss. And a lot of ways, it'll start with the editor. You know, they their vision for the magazine. If there's a new editor at a magazine. They're going to want to put their stamp on it and give it a new approach, you know, both editorially and visually. And so um, that process just begins with, you know, a, a long discussions with the editor about what their goal is and what they want the look of it. And there's anything from, you know, I want it to be brash and tabloid and colorful and in your face, you know, or we want a very, you know, thoughtful, intelligent looking essay type of magazine. So there's a thousand ways to go and to some degree the publisher and based on the, the um, what's happening in the marketplace and what they think the magazine's role should be. But for a Adam, we actually did exactly that. We went to, um, I mean, New York Magazine had sort of gone through a journey in the 80s and 90s of uh, different owners and it became very sort of commercial and very much about you know, where the best places to stay in the Hamptons and, you know, best spas in New York and the kind of a really 
basic city magazine, but it, its roots were, you know, in, in really great journalism in the 60s and 70s. And um, so I think Adam's goal was to take it back to that and, you know, really get good writers and have a more of an impact on the city um, with the journalism. So we actually, the original redesign was based on a lot of the elements of the, the original one from the 60s, which was sort of stripped down. And we, we do things like we try, we just use black typography for the most part, which uh, I think keeps it more in the newspaper. I'm, someone's going to probably go find some color type right now, but we try to just use black. And uh, it keeps it more in that newspaper feel, and there's a certain, adds a certain reader experience to it rather than other magazines, um, you know, a glamour magazine or a fitness magazine, which would use lots of bright colors and sort of do things in a more um, casual way. So that was our goal, was sort of a, somewhere between a newspaper and the early New York magazines, which were um, black type, really stripped down, but then lots of use of scale and size in the typography. And, but just an overall feeling that it's not um, over-designed, but sort of designed in a smart way for the reader. I remember when it, New York first uh, separated itself from the old New York Herald Tribune and became a magazine in its own right. Felker was the editor. I remember I knew one of the writers who was a great writer. Uh, he wrote under the pseudonym of Adam Smith, who was George Goodman, and he said to me, well, New York uh, has an identity. It's having an identity crisis. It ha he said there, there are two things going on. One is it's a service magazine, but the other is the way to sell magazines is to create fear among the middle classes, <laughs> and it would run these cover stories that would be the new journalism amalgamation of pimps in your neighborhood and right. things like that. And uh, But it never occurred to me to ask, well, how does that express itself visually? And who, right. who won out in that? In that I think, board? yeah, the service part is, um, but it's true, the, the, uh, the issues in the 60s would cover things like, yeah, I guess that's a good idea. You have things like, you know, your children's private school is not up to standards or, you know, right. you'd sort of, yeah, have, scrap some, have something that they feel like they have to um, have to buy. Although we just did a similar cover a few weeks ago called The Myth of the Gifted Child. I think there's copies here, um, which is a similar thing basically, you know, about the, the idea of the, the tests that they give four-year-old children um, and to get them into preschools and that interview process. So there is a certain amount of you know, fear, like you need to read this now or there's right. going to be trouble. Okay. All right, so how has the new technology affected the job of designing magazines? I'm not talking about website design. I want to ask you about that in a minute. But just in terms of being an art director and in terms of creating the look of the magazine, how does the technology help or complicate or facilitate what you do? In, um, I guess things happen just a lot faster now. We use uh, the InDesign program to design the pages. Um, but things like, you know, able to FTP and PDF and all the technology that makes things travel faster and photographs happen and working with digital photography, it makes the job a lot faster and easier in some sense um, to produce the magazine. And we do it all in the on the laptop and we do do there is a relationship with our website where we have to go back and forth because they post all the content on the website every week so there's that sort of transfer as well where everything needs to somehow get modified a little bit for the website format um, or get reinterpreted to some degree to go on the website but um, I think for the most part it's it's not uh, we don't bring any technology onto the pages it's just how we produce the magazine right. a lot faster with how we work with illustrators or our photographers okay um, when we were coming down in the elevator, we, you, you asked me about the iPad and, and whether a lot of people here are paying attention to it. And I was saying it's, it's not taught, but it's in, in the elevators and in the corridors, and we talk about it a little in class. And I'm, I'm curious um, whether you think that, how you think the Apple tablet and other new inventions will change the quality of magazines and the big question, whichever, will they cease to exist on paper or not? Right. And give the right answer to that, because I hope <laughs> you know. The paper will live. Well, I think yeah. it's been, it's such a recent conversation, because it, the, the conversation about magazines um, existing online was the dominant conversation for the last five years. And because magazines suddenly wanted, they needed to have a website, and it had to be competitive, and they had to get everything on their website. But just in the last, you know, three months now, there's this technology of the iPad or the tablet where the, the, 
the the visual richness is pres is preserved to some degree of a magazine experience, and you can go through and the pages are presented as they are pages with the typography and photography. There's just added elements like you click through you know multiple photographs with a story. You can just click through and see them rather than turning the page. Or I mean, I saw a demonstration I think yesterday of Wire, of uh, Wired magazine on a tablet and. You know, because they do a lot of infographics in their magazine, they would just sort of the tablet version sort of brought the infographics to life, and you could touch on and see, you know, the result of this information. You know, if it was you know, oil reserves or something, it would just you could go through and look at it in a in a interactive sense. Um, so I think it's changed somewhat in that the rather than the magazine designers thinking that they need to learn all this web design skills and translate to that. Now it's looking like taking what we already do and expand it just into using motion and using um, more of a touch technology. So, and But maintaining the same way of thinking where you commission illustrations, photography, and those all run. Because the web really isn't a comparable, the web sort of strips down the content. It's really digestible things that, that the role, the traditional role of the art director doesn't sort of have a role in. But. So will magazines exist on paper, or won't they exist on paper five years down the road in your in my estimation? Impartial. Um, I judgment. think they will. I think they will exist on paper. Yes, me too. Good. Yeah. All right. Right answer. Good. I think uh, advertisers like it as well. I mean, okay. advertisers like having okay. the, the the place to put their and, ads. But you, maybe you've already answered this in what you said about the web. But how designing a magazine for something like the tablet differs from designing it for some, uh, something on paper. Uh, you've already answered that. And, oh, good. Okay. Yeah, I so, think so. Good. OK, <laughs> I'm not going to get going. Um, I want to ask one more question, and I want to invite you all to join in now. Um, not everyone out here is. Uh, is like me and uh, doesn't have a good eye for design. And uh, I think I have a good eye for caricature and not a good eye for design. How do you, if you're an editor or a writer and have no particular aesthetic pretensions, there are some people out here I know who, who have not only pretensions but uh, sensibilities that ambitions, <laughs> ambitions and yeah. sensibilities, and they can recognize it. And they, but how do you develop a good eye? How do you, um, as a word person, become more sensitive, uh, engaged by, tuned into, understand the aesthetic principles of? I guess it would just be a matter of exposing yourself to magazines that are considered um, well designed or well produced. Um, things like Vanity Fair and Wired magazine, and um, you know things with food magazines like Bon Appetit magazines like that that take the content of recipes and you know really visualize it in this big dramatic way throughout their magazine. So I guess just exposing yourself and looking at those things and seeing how the experience changes for you when you. Uh, read a magazine because the the straight words I guess that an editor or writer works with are you know they they take on another life form once they enter a magazine and so and that's how readers are accustomed to interacting with with um, with your words is to surround it with pictures or have it broken up into different digestible bites and things like that so um, I think people are more we find a lot of times editors are they they are usually generally excited about the process and when they even if they don't engage with it, they, when they see the end results, they're usually excited because they could never imagine that their piece would end up would being presented. That. And there's a bit of a competition among editors. You know, we have five or six of our key editors that do most of the pieces. And so if one piece gets a great photo essay or some really great funny illustrations that are going to bring attention to that piece, then they feel like they're excited because their piece is being presented in a way. And then other editors will right. say, where's my magic? Why aren't you bringing right. mine to life in that way? And we'll say, we don't have time. So. And, and I assume that same competition goes on in terms of who gets the cover right? and what the visual of the cover is going to be. And, and beforehand, one of, our, one of you made an appointment to come sit in on a cover conference. But could you share with us what the considerations are in uh, I think we we understand the news Enos consideration, but what right. are the cultural considerations and the aesthetic considerations, and how do they express themselves in a cover right. um, discussion? And 
I th well, there's generally, a, for us, um, um, you know, the editor will pick a story that he feels is co the cover. You know, next week's the cover will be the John Edwards piece, or it's going to be the story on, you know, the gifted children. So that's sort of determined that that has more, you know, viability as a cover rather than just inside. And so then we work at presenting it in a way. But what will happen, though, sometimes is that either the piece will be re-edited or come in and it's just not as strong, or the news will change somehow and it doesn't feel as relevant, or the visual that we put together will somehow not just not work as a cover. It's too complicated an idea to get across. And so, but meanwhile, maybe visuals are developing for another feature inside that are actually working, and we'll move that onto the cover because it's sort of determined to be um, successful. So I think, you know, there is a flexibility through the week as we do the magazine where we look to see what's going to make, you know, the best cover um, because a lot of that is, you know, the quick read of the cover and it's something that feels relevant to people right then. And a lot of times our editor will change the cover midweek if something happens in the news, especially as a weekly. Um, you know, I think the most famous example was two years ago or a year ago when the Elliot Spitzer, um, you know, scandal happened in New York and he was caught with ha all of the prostitutes and and that news came out on a Tuesday morning and we were in the middle of, you know, working on an issue about, I don't know what it was, something else. But um, he made the decision to just drop everything and that was going to become the cover and the cover story. So we had to generate, you know, all new artwork between Tuesday and Thursday to run on the cover so that it would come out Monday and be relevant to that news cycle. So um, that, I, I think there's the flexibility. Forgive me, I forget. Did you put him on the cover or the call girl on the cover or both of them on the no, cover? No, we actually so. had, we worked with the artist, um, Barbara, or I can't, why am I forgetting anyone right now? Um, Barbara Kruger, sorry. She did, we did had him on the cover smiling and then we had the red box that said brain and it was pointing to his groin region. That was the cover. And that was yeah. it. <laughs> and uh, we got lucky because we, we, we were able to produce that in a couple of days, but it did become somewhat uh, iconic. But that was, that was definitely following the news. So. Good. Okay. So why don't you join us and come in with your questions? I have one question here. Um, Great. I, I believe that uh, the design trends change faster than the editorial trends. And my question is, how do you keep updated with these uh, new trends on design, and how do you share these trends with the with the rest of your team? Um, what, I, what publication do you read? What websites? Right. I think we, uh, you know, I, the trends. I guess you, it's a matter of staying ahead of them to some degree. Design-wise, you know, we don't want to stray too far or make any quick moves in the magazine. Design-wise, just because, as I said, you want to have a identity and a fixed identity for the reader and so they don't feel like you're jumping all over the place with the visual style. But I think we try to f use photographers and illustrators and um, caricature people that are maybe not as exposed and we'll, a lot of times we'll try to find an you know, new young people that are working in Europe for things and to do work for our magazine so that people, that the, where the visuals feel fresh rather than using um, you know, different contributors that are been different magazines are using. But I think we'll look at, you know, there's GQ magazine is very well designed and um, wired, and the New York Times magazine is very well designed in a in a slightly more subdued way. But they always have great, you know, illustrations and sort of their conceptual art contributors. They work they work with artists a lot of the time, and the artists who traditionally do work in the art world will do work for the magazine. And that's sort of a, a fresh, you know, a different take on it. So, but yeah, we definitely all just look and see what's going on, you know, visually in the culture, and we will have meetings and look at certain things evolving and try to, you know, make sure that we're that we're adapting or evolving visually ourselves. So, thanks. Yeah, Fred. Hi, I was uh, wondering you could, if you could talk a bit about the editorial and, des and design decisions, I, I guess the conversation that goes into creating the, uh, the approval matrix, because I know that's a lot of people's favorite part of the oh, book. Oh, the matrix, yeah. The matrix. Um, well, that was, I mean, it, once we established the form of that, uh, you know, we did a lot of prototypes of that when we first introduced it, I think four years ago. Um, just different ways of presenting that information, but we landed on what we have in the magazine. There's an editor, there's a, a matrix editor every week. He's one of the editors. Um, he works on various sections, but he basically uh, asks for contributions from the whole magazine. He'll just send an email out and say, people submit you know, things for the matrix. He'll just get you know 100 or so together and then put together the page and then run it by the editor-in-chief and we'll make sure that it doesn't cross over. A lot of times we'll find something in the matrix that will 
you know, be critical of something we're running already in the magazine. So we have to be care careful of the crossover of that because the Matrix has kind of a snarky, you know, they'd make fun of everything and they'll put something in there on an actor and then we'll realize we've been doing a feature on that same actor and the issue and so we'll have to quickly change it. But um, yeah, it's true. It is one of the one of the most read pages in the magazine. So, but um, there's just one editor that puts it together with, with contributions from everyone, so. When, when someone contributes a matrix piece, do they have to contribute it in, under a category or like a specific rating? You know, yeah, like, they'll say, yeah, this they, is a highbrow despicable thing yeah, happening. Yeah, they'll, be, they'll say what their estimation is, but sometimes the editor will change where that goes. They have the right to overrule your, your ratio. And, but I think people are always proud. I sometimes send in things to him and, and if they show up, I'm still a little excited to see it on there. If that it gets in into that place, so, but everyone has different. You know, I'll have a, some sort of design or visual related thing, and other editors will have other things. So, yeah. Yeah. How do you gauge your readers' responses to the covers? Like, do you focus primarily on letters to the editor, or email feedback, or focus groups? And what have been your most popular covers, and why? Maybe over the past year or two. Um, yeah, I think between letters and there's just a general sense of uh, the response to it. People will write in or phone in or email or comment. So we have a sense of what people react to. Um, the cover that's out right now is actually, oh, I guess we don't have it here. But um, it's, uh, we have Christina Hendricks on the cover and she's from Mad Men. She's wearing a sort of lingerie. So in that, when it gets picked up and post, I, that one got picked up on Huffington Post and written about. So then you see mostly through comments on other websites that will, and our own website, people will write comments about the cover. Um, and then from that, we'll sort of determine what people liked or didn't like. And I'm just trying to think of the more popular ones. I think this year, I mean, last year, the when we did Bernie Madoff as the Joker, I think that was one of the most popular ones of the year. And it's interesting because things, Things that are funny or engaging or there happen to be newsworthy at the time tend to sell a lot, sell really well. You know, you can't really predict it. Other things that you thought people would really like. Um, I think I brought one of the issues was the sex diaries issue that we did, and um, but we thought that would sell really well, but it actually didn't sell that well. But you know, Bernie Madoff as the Joker. You know, when everyone was talking about it and that those feelings were out there about him, then that actually sold really well. So I think that was the most popular last year. Yeah, well, there, yeah, why don't you use the mic, Derek, we can. Thanks. Hi, can you kind of talk about how you became the art director and also kind of talk about um, what kind of main hours does it take to put in to, to make a weekly magazine like this? The, um, well, I started there as the, yeah, it says, Victor mentioned the titles get a little confusing, but I started as the title of art director five years ago, which is essentially the number two position. Um, so now I have the title of design director, which is confusing, but it's the step up from art director, but they're both interchangeable. They just mean you're in charge of it. But I was the number two position basically uh, for two years, and then I got promoted to the job of design director. So I've had that job for three years now. So, um, and I think, uh, and a lot of the people at the magazine have all been there over the last five years, so we all sort of work together and, and know each other really well. And I think, um, oh, what was the second part of the question, sorry? Oh, man hours, women hours. It's, uh, it's a lot of hours. We do as a weekly, it's, um, we, we ship the magazine to the printer on Friday morning, and it starts printing Friday afternoon. That's why sometimes you can see it on newsstands on s by Saturday, the thing that we've just produced, so it's really quite quick. But So Thursday night is really, Wednesday night and Thursday night, we work until usually 10 o'clock or 11 on Wednesday, and then Thursday night we usually work till around 12 or 1 in the morning and um, that we get the bulk of the ma magazine done in that time and then we come in Friday morning and look at proofs and do all these little final tweaks and then it's usually done by about n noon. So, I mean, I don't know what it is per hour, but you know, week to week, you, Monday, Tuesdays are usually, we can, we come in at 9.30 or so and we go home at like 6.30 or 7, it's fairly normal and then once we start closing, you know, depending on the issue, if it's a big issue and it gets complicated, you just there's just going to take more time because there's sort of a trickle down between the words and the editors and getting stuff edited and things chosen before you can. The designers a lot of times are the last people in the uh, process because everything has to be decided and finished before you can design it. So that's why we end up being there a little bit later. But it's definitely some late nights uh, every week. So the uh, just on the title business, Troy. 
Uh, so there's art director, design, editor, above that now. You work in a s standalone, so y you're not in one of these companies that has a creative director on top of it. What do they do? Uh, <laughs> What's the, their uh, job when they, the Condé Nast has a creative director? Yeah, a lot of magazines have, well, there's different, it's, it's different interpreting. A creative director can either be the, basically you're in charge of the whole visual department, but that's the same thing as the design director in some ways is you're in you're charge the of the department. Director. So it's just a choice of title. I think, though, that I share at our magazine, we have a photography director, and she's, you know, she's in charge of the photography, you know, working with the rest of us, but so really, and I think between us, between design director and photography director, we're kind of on an equal platform in terms of visually doing the magazine. But I think when a magazine has a creative director, they put themselves above everyone, and they, you know, or say they're in charge of, you know, the photography and everything else. So. Okay, I have another question, but I want to hear from Sudi first. Um, Good. The New York Times and two German newspapers won the New House Design Award yesterday. What do you think makes these newspapers work visually? The New York Times and uh, two German news. Oh, okay. Um, I think the Times, uh, yeah, they have a beautiful newspaper, and they. I mean, although I don't think the Times is the one of the more successful ones. I think the my favorite newspaper is the Guardian, design-wise, in, in London. That's a beautiful newspaper. I mean, the Times, I think, is always looks like the Times, and it's consistent. So that I, I think they don't. I think if they whenever they, if they try a little too hard to make something a little more design or look current, it doesn't actually feel that good on the on their page. But I think their strength is, you know, they do great infographics at the New York Times, the double page spread things on events, you know, such as 9-11, things like that, where there was sort of these amazing information presented visually. And I think that that's a, a big strength of theirs. So, um, uh, but I think it's, uh, yeah, it's a great looking uh, newspaper. And the magazines that they do are all uh, really beautiful as well. Great. Yeah, let's get you. I actually have a question about your work in Adbusters. All right. So, do you guys? Um, so I know, like, do you guys cre come up with the ideas for the ads there, or who has like direction? Adbusters. Um, well, that was a long time ago that I was there. I was just. Uh, it was in. I was there in, in up until two thousand and one. So, but when I was there, we. Could you destroy, describe Adbusters for those who don't know it, even though there are a lot of people here who do? And it's uh, it's sort of like a counterculture journal that was published out of Vancouver, Canada, but it's distributed, um, you know, internationally. The and the editor there, it's always been his magazine. His name's Kali Lassen, and um, it was sort of a quarterly magazine, four times a year, and he had a very strong voice, you know, mostly about consumerism, which is where the name the Adbusters came in. So it was the idea of consumerism, but as it related to the environment and as it related to people's, um, you know, state of mind in a consumer society. So and when I went in there, they were doing a lot of the, they would do these sort of parody ads of things. And I didn't work on those as much because I sort of had the task of making the magazine, you know, as an object, uh, redesigning it in a way that was really, um, you know, appealing to the readers and they could use to distribute all over the world. So I didn't work as much on the static, you know, single ad work, but I worked on creating the, the design of the whole magazine and the covers and working on those. Because we were doing six a year, I think, by the time I left there. So, um, you know, there was sort of a balance there of doing, you know, it was essentially a counterculture magazine, but we wanted it to be, you know, accepted by readers and not feel like they're something that they wouldn't want to read or be screaming at them. So we sort of designed in a way that was, people could, absorb it nicely and it looked pretty good, but the writing, I think, was would be considered more um, radical to some degree. Okay. Good. Uh, let me ask the last question, unless someone here has wants to do it. I, when you were going down the hierarchy of um, creative director, <laughs> design, it, interesting. It's interesting. It occurs to me that, uh, and I've thought this for a long time, the word illustrator <laughs> It to me is a uh, has a demeaning connotation in terms of the hierarchy. It says, in effect, he's a mere she's a mere illustrator right. of someone else's work. And I always thought, what would happen if there were a magazine where the artists uh, were first, and then the writers would illustrate <laughs> with words what they right. had done, or at least be inspired by the art to do their words. And I wonder um, if you could talk a little about illustrators and their and the relationship to word people and the and this idea that artists are 
uh, second-class citizens in the world of magazines? And well, I think, um, I mean, I guess it depends on the magazine. We work with a lot of illustrators. I mean, I guess their role in the, we work with our illustrators as they're sort of experts in their field, and we will we'll have them interpret, you know, we won't dictate an idea to them as much, depending on the, on the sometimes there'll be something specific to be illustrated. But the Sometimes it'll be your idea, but not usually? Yeah, not yeah. usually. I mean, I think yeah. unless it's, I mean, when, if we're looking for a portrait, you know, if we can't photograph someone, we want like a really beautiful painting of them or drawing of them, and we'll go to someone who that's, you know, their expertise to just produce beautiful, so they won't have to be a, a concept, but they can interpret it however they want, and then that's sort of their, um, they're bringing that to the magazine. There's a few, there's an illustrator named um, Christoph Niemann that we work with. He lives in Germany, but he does very, very funny conceptual things. So all we do in his instance is send him just the straight manuscript of the story, you know, in an email, and he'll read it and send sketches of funny ways of interpreting it, and then we'll look at those with the editor of the piece and, and see. But we work with a lot of illustrators like that. We'll just send off the text, and uh, so we have a high, uh, a high re regard for them, but I think um, they are, they, unless they're being told to illustrate a specific idea, they, um, I think they feel somewhat empowered to some degree. Good. Well, thank you for taking us behind the scenes of the visual world that is in front of us all the time, and we appreciate you. your coming here. Yeah, thank you. Thank it's good you. To see you. Right. Nice, thanks for your questions.